Hello, greetings, friends. Welcome to this session on early warnings and early action, which is not going to be your typical shut up and listen and uh, someone talks to you. There will be an experiential dimension to this. This session is about experiencing the complexity of future risks in ways that are serious and fun. My name is Pablo, Pablo Suarez. There was a time when I was a full-time researcher on climate and disasters. Then I became a humanitarian worker about 15 years ago, working mostly with the Red Cross, Red Crescent Climate Center, a team that helps everyone from uh, understanding tomorrow's hurricane to long-term sea level rise. And then I became a collaborator with creative folks like artists, humorists, game designers. Now, I've attended 16 consecutive COPs, being there face to face in the big room where someone talks. And to be frank, not enough happens. It is my experience that the sessions we design are designed devoid of experience with a lot of talking, often very valuable information, but research shows that showing research does not work. So what we're going to do over the coming 90 minutes or so is to share with you some unconventional approaches to how we can engage in linking what we know with what we do. How can we link the warnings from science to the actions from doers, from farmers, from policymakers, from humanitarian workers, from funders, from those who shape culture. One first example will only work if I manage to push the buttons right, because you know how technology can be. Let's see if this works. There we go. Some of you physically present at the COP have probably walked through the blue zone and seen a very large wall filled with cartoons. It's like eight and a half meters, 28 feet of cartoons. The one on the left, Atlas of Doom, signed IPCC. This is great. Now we know what to expect, says the geeky looking fellow. I used to be like that. I used to create maps and graphs and equations that showed what to expect and what could be done about it. Now, unlike the one on the right, where people read in this cartoon ways of adapting, I found that when I spoke conventionally, people tended to fall asleep. My publications about likely future conditions, yeah, they existed and they were available, but they didn't really shape decisions. And it seems to me that policy and action is downstream of emotion and culture. So these are two of the cartoons that emerged from our collaboration with negotiators at the COP. We have 20 negotiators from Sweden, from Trinidad and Tobago, from Kuwait, engaging with professional cartoonists, creating content and delivering. Now, let's see if I can make this work. That's a photo of the cartoon wall. Again, for those of you at the COP, if not, if you're joining this event online, please go to the climatecenter.org, Climatecentre, spelled the British way, and you will be able to view, to get a taste of how uh, we have been harnessing the power of humor, which is spectacular to help people imagine, imagine potential consequences of today and reimagine how today feels, how today is. Here is one example. Yeah, we're pretty freaked out too, say the sheep to the girl who cannot fall asleep. This cartoon by Emily Flake was from our very first cartoonathon, an event that is like a hackathon, a marathonic encounter of people who have an issue, in our case, how to deal with the mental health consequences of being constantly overdrained by a changing climate that is looking bad, is looking horrible. My humanitarian colleagues cannot keep up with the current shocks triggered by climate. And I am very distressed because as we move forward, the climate is guaranteed to change much worse 
How much worse depends on how much the COP and others succeed at addressing the causes of climate change. But we have to think of consequences of climate change. How are we going to not freak out and get stuff going, get into action? This is one of many examples of what I used to do. A journal article, action-based forecasting to trigger humanitarian decisions and actions with graphs, with equations. I'm a math geek. I use the language of mathematics to understand and address change. Now, check out this one, published in 2005, based on research we did starting in the late 1990s. Mathematical modeling of how transportation network would be change system-wide by a changing climate, sea level, extreme events. Now, what I like about having found this journal again is that in 2005, we published about likely impacts in 2025, which to me, you know, I was a PhD student, sounded like in the infinitely distant future. And it's around the corner. I have white, but I hope to have three to five decades left of being alive. The future comes. The future is coming. Another thing I like about this paper is that at the time when I spoke of system-wide performance, I was referring to performance metrics. You know, how much delay, how many lost trips, how many people killed. But now, when I think of performance, I think of a, a cultural performance. I think of a concert. I think of a puppet show. I think of a game that is a performative engagement with others because I have found that in addition to the research, in addition to the negotiations, we need to bring more presence, the things that make your skin become alive and your heartbeat pop. This is one example of what we have done over the past 15 years. I was with my colleague Andrew at NASA for four days training the scientists that work on everything from satellite image to climate modeling on how to communicate what we know. You can see dice, you can see investments in insurance and extreme risks. You are going to get a taste of this game near the end of this session. You will make decisions with consequences. There will be winners and losers. And unfortunately, like in the world, the performance of this game can give you an insight of what can go wrong and what, what can, can we do about it. This is another example from a game session in the Zambezi River in Southern Africa. Look at those faces. Instead of the usual workshop sitting under a tree, hello, we are from the Red Cross, and there's a flood risk in this floodplain, and here's what we know about climate change. You know, people fall asleep when I speak, especially when I speak science. But here, with our colleagues from the Parsons School, designers, we created a game that invited people to actually look at what happens, represented by dice and other objects, and if certain extreme conditions emerge, they have to, boom, trigger action and run, run to make the things that they themselves thought should be done for flood preparedness. Now, you look at those games, those muscles are engaged, but look at those faces. They are having a blast. Neuroscience shows that when you're experiencing emotions, your cognitive system imprints the memory in a way that is more durable and easier to grasp when you need it. So when we do what we do with analytical rigor, we have learned that the analytical rigor benefits from an emotionally rich and culturally resonant enterprise. Not only with scientists and with vulnerable people, I also play the game at the White House. This was about a decade ago and before me were you know, many presenters saying, hello and welcome, my name is so-and-so from organization this and that. And there was a problem and we came and there's a solution. And if you give us money, there can be more. I was the second speaker after lunch. You can imagine that I knew those people would be brain dead. So when it was my turn in front of 130 people, I said, hello, my name is Pablo from the Red Cross. And this is not a Frisbee, it's a hurricane. If it hits you in the chest, you're in trouble. Everyone, please stand up. And we're like, what? Some 
woke up while others were awake, standing up, not understanding. We played a five minute game. We rolled some dice, which determined if the hurricane, the frisbee went in that direction, in that direction or in that direction, hitting people. Everyone was confused, but awake and connected and curious. What is going on? And then finally someone figured out the rule. I was rolling two dice to determine where to send the storm. Double one throw over six over here, double six throw over there, interpolate. And someone said, oh, a five and a three and eight, it's going over there. Everyone sat down as I threw the Frisbee violently. It's made of foam, no one got hurt. But they sat and it flew above their heads and it hit the wall of the White House room and everyone was like, yay! I'm clapping, and when the celebration subsided, I said, congratulations, you linked early warning with early action, and you saved yourselves. Now think of Hurricane Katrina. Strongest hurricane on Earth. Science said it was coming, and yet over a 1,000 people died. Much more so Philippines, Mozambique, you name it. How can we link knowledge with action? I'm Pablo from the Red Cross, happy to talk. And people remember, people engage, people want to do more. We've had many unconventional sessions at the COP and beyond. For those of you not familiar with the development and climate days, we've had all sorts of things from humor to games to flying sculptures to a chef uh, cooking insects and serving them in Paris and people really enjoying them. Now, this is the contrast. Go to sleep. Go to sleep. I am presenting to you. Go to sleep. And most of the time, go to sleep. We are talking to people. Go to sleep. Telling people, go to sleep, that they should notice. Go to sleep. What we are doing, go to sleep. And we say things, go to sleep, in a way that sounds go to sleep, designed intentionally to go to sleep, to make people go to sleep. Go to sleep. Go to sleep. Now, engage. It's time for action. Engage. This this is the format of our sessions at the COP and beyond. Of course, since my first COP in Buenos Aires, 2004, every session presents information and calls for action, but asks people to stay sitting during the session. So what we're going to do now is to engage you and act and intervene in ways that hopefully you will find uh, engaging and maybe illuminating and maybe worthy of your replication for next steps. What we're going to do very soon, Mark, not yet, in a few moments, I'm going to invite you to share the chat, uh, the link in the chat. We're going to play a game called All Caps Rant. We're going to invite you to share with us what is annoying, what is infuriating about events, COP or in your own organization or in your own country, about the future of climate risks. So you're, if I were to type one word, I could type boring. But instead of typing one word, we're going to give you about 90 seconds in a special website where you're going to be invited to pour your soul out. This is what it will look like. You will have a countdown. And you, you write with your fury, with your gut. Ah! Don't say boring. If you can't say, why are meetings so boring that I cannot hold my soul? Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. You will see the countdown. Importantly, for those of you in the room, you hear me live in real time. For those of you joining online, you are 15 seconds delayed. <laughs> so you hear me with me speaking from the future. So the countdown won't be the same for both, but when it happens, you can no longer uh, speak. Mark, if you can, please share in the chat the location of the rant. Uh, and if I remember correctly, it's uh, the short options is bit.ly uh, slash COP26-RH. Mark, I'm going to invite you to speak uh, so that I can hear because uh, I cannot see what other people see if the link is available and if people are getting to log in. The link is available. Excellent. So friends, go to the chat, look at the place where you see what you see. Uh, I don't know for those of you joining from the um, Resilience Hub a live stream. No chat. Uh, if there is no chat, Mark, could you recite the 
the name of the bit.ly if you have it handy for people who may not be able to see the chat. Absolutely. Bit, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash C-O-P 26 dash R-H. Repeat. And you can say it one more time a bit more slowly and then we start. Yep. B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash C-O-P 26 dash R-H. Bit dot L-Y slash COP26 dash R-H for Resilience Hub. If you're there, you're there. Otherwise, you're not. We're going to start ranting. And for those who are not there, I will uh, narrate what we see. Hit it on, uh, Mark. Please keep it. Uh, start the countdown. Oh, I now realize I cannot see. So, Mark, I'm going to ask you we, to read. We are going. Screen. Yep. <laughs> Excellent. And thank you all for your patience. If you're in the room, you can talk to your neighbor. What do you find annoying or infuriating about events? Stand up, walk up to someone, or turn your, turn around. You have 90 seconds or less to share insights. What's boring? What's annoying? What's infuriating about events on future climate? And the runs are coming. I'm going to stop screen share. <clears throat> and you know, we, we know that what people consistently report about what's wrong is that there's no, no time to engage, that it's too much being talked at, that it's too much uh, yada yada, that it's been said before, that, that not enough inspiration happens. We need to reimagine how we do what we do when we are together. We need to think ahead of time. How are we going to help experience the complexity of future risks? We need to reinvent how we relate to what we know. What is infuriating is emerging from our own actions and inactions. We can change how we do what we do. We can change our future. Allow me to rehydrate. Mark, can you tell me how many seconds left? We've just expired. Ranting is finished. Very good. So we move on. And I am going to return to this uh, slideshow. Ta -ta -da. Now, you should be seeing a slide that says experiencing the complexity of future risk. Let me go here, share screen, there, and share. Good. I want to acknowledge not only the support and joy of working with the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center, but also the phenomenal help of the Lloyd's Register Foundation which has been really, really generous in supporting my explorations in creative communications for a safer world. You will learn more about LRF and one of our colleagues very soon. By the way, for those of you who uh, heard of the Development and Climate Days, this event is also part of that Resilience Hub, as well as Development and Climate Days. Global ambition, local action, climate resilience for all. So, Exactly a week ago, the opening session at the Resilience Hub was about arts and culture and heritage. What we did was to engage participants actively, just like you did now, typing in a website and offering insights to reimagine our journey from knowledge to action. It was a hybrid event. It was decisively unconventional, by far the craziest thing I have done in my professional life. And some of you know that I've done a few crazy things. Now, let me give you a taste of what we did because it has to do with what you will experience and what you can do in the future if you want. We can do so much. My life has changed over this past week. My professional life will be different because of what we did since November 1st, since this session at the Resilience Hub. And I look forward to shaping my own future 
with you if you want. As background, this is a photo involving Maria Cesarina Ottavina Becchini di Bertoncini, la nonna, my grandma, celebrating her 100th birthday here flirting with the lead mariachi. Italian, left Italy in the 40s to go to Argentina. I grew up in her household. She had a very sharp risk management mindset. She liked Mexican music for some reason, so we found Mexican mariachis, and here we are singing along. Now, she used to say, difficile come pestar la luna. When I wanted to do something that to her seemed impossible, she said, impossible as, as stepping on the moon. Think of Nona, born 1910. Child looking at the moon, the same moon that we all see. It hasn't changed at all, pretty much. Maybe a little dust specks, a little meteorite changing something. Look at the moon. Nona thinks, who can step there? Step on the moon. Well, it turns out, humans stepped on the moon before I was born. Yes, it's possible. It's not impossible to do difficult things. And as you may have heard, humans are about to go to the moon again. Indeed, I'm happy to report that a wonderful team from the Future Frontiers Institute is working on the setup of the Lunar University so that the first entity to have an extended presence, rocket goes to the moon with human, comes back and leaves the human there. That is expected to happen in 2030. Around the corner, think of you and your life. You will be around, you will be doing stuff if a meteorite doesn't fall on your head. The Lunar University is intended to inspire and educate and be of benefit to Earth, to Earthlings, to us. And I've been invited with John and others to contribute to how to link art and culture to make that lunar endeavor engage us humans. So we commissioned for the Resilience Hub a work of art. This was done by Argentinian artist Santiago Espeche. And you may be wondering, what the hell does it all have to do with what we're talking about? Be patient. This is a photo of the moon that Santiago noticed something rotated, added color. It's about Mare Undarum, a region of the moon called the Sea of Waves because of how things seem to be and move. This sea of waves was offered to participants last week as one of the many triggers. And we invited not only the participants to come up with ideas of things that they think could happen, and they reported on taking Johann Sebastian back and changing it to show how instruments have changed over time and they're changing with climate change, uh, all the way to poetry, filmmaking, cartoons, songwriting, but tick, one of the most amazing ones is a team from Vanuatu that has, I worked with them in the past. And in this very same location, they offered to do a, an art installation on the beach, ephemeral art, art intentionally designed to go away when nature takes it. In this case, of course, it's Vanuatu, everything is near the coast. This on the beach, they ended up embracing that lunar offer, bearing in mind that king tides are one of the major threats to the Pacific in a changing climate, sea level rise, and so on. And they, they did something right there, which you will see in a video in a few moments, which by design, the moon took away. And they are inviting us to think of what are we doing? Are we allowing climate change to take away from them, their culture, their livelihoods, their soul. I, I have to say, uh, working with artists has been transformational for me as a scientist and as a humanitarian worker. I hope you enjoy this. A few more things that you will see on the top left is uh, Richard Comlan Foley, one of our dear collaborators from Togo where we did one of those early warning systems with forecast-based financing and he helped process data. A geeky guy who's also a songwriter, we invited Richard to write a song about this endeavor and he saw what we did with Vanuatu, with Argentina, and you will see him in the very end, inspired by the lunar uh, presence to talk about what we're doing. Bottom left, 
Right next door, two doors, is one of a hundred living harpsichord makers, Hendrik, my neighbor. We co-created a bizarre story about the changing climate from the perspective of Johann Sebastian Bach. On the right, what you see is one of my favorite <laughs> discoveries of recent. That is one of many artworks that uses thermochromic pigment, pigment, ink, paint, that changes with the temperature. In that one, which is, uh, Jeanne, would you mind passing the, the, the one with the fish? I'm going to stop share. Okay, this is what you will see in the video. There's a fish that looks a little angry and said, well, oh, perhaps a few degrees of warming won't be that bad. And you'll see the water. And you'll see in the video what happens when that water gets warmer. Now, there's a, there's a lot of them there that were created here at home. This one in particular, you know, the cartoonist's quintessential uh, cartoon of the desert island. But see what happens when Jano turns on the <laughs> We just used a hair dryer to blow heat with oil, with carbon in the atmosphere. We're turning islands into desert islands and we're turning happy humans into climate migrants. This, my friends, <laughs> happened in my home with artists published in the New Yorker magazine, inspired by what you did on November 1st. Unbelievable. Let me go back to share screen. Uh, okay, I think you can see again a few more, and then you'll see the video, so you can you can see the works directly. Here on the top left, you see AJ and Leah, my dear collaborators, who came who brought thermochromic pigment to our attention. And guess what? Our very initial ideas, including their masks, inspire or expired were invited by the Tate Museum, one of the top art museums in the world, in London, showing our collaboration for COP26. Thank you, Leah and AJ. On the bottom right, a puppet show made with recycled cardboard puppets. This show was invented based on what participants said a week ago, was delivered, was filmed. You will see it at work. And two days ago on Saturday, it was shown at a puppet festival in Buenos Aires, Mundo Titere Fest 2021. This creation is already making a difference in the outskirts of Buenos Aires with shantytown dwellers, with passerby. This is how art can inspire. Your ideas a week ago from the Resilience app became inspiration and became action. And now there's some more people who are aware of how Dali and his melting clock relate to our increasing heat waves. A batik from Indonesia, inspired by what emerged from the, the session, they thought, you know, many people are talking about what's precious to them. The Trevi fountain in Rome, what if it goes dry, said the participant. The obelisk in Buenos Aires, what if it became a thermometer that shows how temperature is changing? So our, our colleagues said, okay, what do we know and care about from Indonesia? And they chose the Komodo Islands where the dragon, the Komodo dragon, the largest land reptile, uh, phenomenal creature works collectively to hunt its prey. Intelligent collective behavior like we need humans endangered because of sea level rise and, and climate change and drought. So they depicted uh, this Komodo dragon looking into the future. Another one by your friends from Cosmica, the institute that engages art from space, thinking of a collective creation of a serenade to Earth. Game designers, Fortnite. I forgot the numbers. Hundreds of millions of players playing Fortnite. I'm not one of them, but many are. And our colleague Felix, a, a colleague collaborating with us from the Adrian Arch Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center, to which both Felix and I are affiliated, they made a tweak, a hack proposal to address the risk of too much heat 
exhausting players as they run around and build things and do stuff to others. On the right, a new game ready to play by Matteo Menapache, which uses the creations that emerge by other artists. Whew. So we're going to show you a video very soon. It will be about 10 minutes. You have a task, both online and in the room. First of all, enjoy the video. I think some of the creations are very beautiful. Then, as you watch it, try to identify one example of a, a co-creation, art, batik, music, poetry, whatever, that resonates with you, with your work life, with your vulnerability, with your capabilities in the face of climate and resilience. And then when we come back, we're going to invite you to write in the chat or talk to your neighbor about one emotion or one insight inspired by what you saw in the video. So I'm going to pause and I'm going to invite our colleagues from the tech side of this event to start playing the video. Thank you, friends. Take it away. Pablo Suarez. So what we're going to do now in this session is to invite you to go into this website and type what art comes to mind, what culture, what heritage comes to your mind when thinking of climate and resilience. And now we're going to invite you to think of them as your ingredient for tweaking, for modifying. What do you think we could do with those works of art and culture to tell an interesting story about climate and resilience? You're going to give us an offer and what you share with us will be offered to artists that we have invited from around the world. have done is to invite artists from Argentina to Vanuatu, batik artists, poets, game designers, makers of artisanship with natural materials to be inspired by your ideas and to create their own gifts. Guardian.
So, let's talk about climate change adaptation with a twist, inspired by Johann Sebastian Bach. This is a harpsichord, an instrument from a different time. It speaks an archaic language that many appreciate today. Like all instruments that are centuries old, the harpsichord was created with a specific environment in mind, the wood. The strings, the mechanisms can harmoniously coexist within certain conditions of humidity, temperature, and so on. When it gets unusually hot or dry, its elements deform just a bit, enough to alter the tension and make the harmony disharmonious. So, let's ask ourselves, what if climate change arrived with full evil force and brought change to our delicate balance. What would it sound like? Now, think of your life, your work, your instruments, musical instruments, financial instruments. Think of performances that matter to you, performances of entertainers, of crops, of teams. How will they deal with a changing climate? Are they ready? Are you ready for a global climate going out of tune? It's time to notice, to listen, to care. When the balance goes off track, will you be ready to act? Future Memories is a cooperative hack of memory, the classic pair matching game. But instead of competing against the other players to hoard cards, in Future Memories, we all work together to imagine a future in a changing climate. The future holds both opportunities and crises. So you will play imagined cards to inspire hopeful visions and share them with the other players. Then the game will challenge you with crisis cards. If the crisis cards run out, then we all lose. But if we match all the pairs and in the process telling and retelling our future memories, then we all win. So, can you imagine being someone who invites others to think about climate and resilience and finding such remarkable resonance? I am still in disbelief at the generosity, the talent, the ability to capture the essence of what we're confronting. Did you notice in the puppet show that after Mr. Dali, the artist, melts at 1.5 degrees, the thermometer itself melts at 2 degrees? Remember when it rained in Greenland and scientists couldn't measure how much it rained because they were only prepared to measure snow? We are not equipped for what's coming, and artists can tell that story in 45 seconds. So uh, let me go back to share screen and remind you of your task.
over the coming couple of minutes. Oops, I think I chose the wrong one. Let me go here. Your task now is to uh, have a share of what did you enjoy? What resonated with you? Can you share one emotion or one insight in the chat or with people around you if you are in the event at the COP Blue Zone? Uh, let's give you two minutes or less. What happened with this video? What resonated? What, what can you share? Converse with your neighbor or type in the chat. I'll return in a minute. What, what happened? What do you think could happen? Can you make any of this part of your work life? How about playing games, engaging artists, harnessing the power of music and inspiration? So we will review your comments in the chat or with each other momentarily. Meanwhile, those of you in the room, I invite you to start wrapping up your conversation and come back to plenary. Very sorry I couldn't be with you after 16 consecutive COPs. This is the first one that I facilitate like 10 sessions, but from the distance. Um, so what we're going to start doing now is to enter a new phase in this session. We're going to be talking about how data can become action but not data about temperature and atmospheric conditions, data about us humans, what we think, what we perceive. The Lloyd's Register Foundation, which has kindly helped a lot of what you saw, has a, in collaboration with Gallup, set up the World Risk Poll, which is inviting people from around the world to answer a few key questions. One of the questions that was asked involved perceptions of climate change. Uh, are you concerned about climate change for your country for the next 20 years? And the answers could be yes, or a bit, or not at all. And we have those answers. Now, I want you to think of people in your own country. Picture someone who is male and older than 40. What are they thinking? What are they enjoying? What art and culture is part of their life? Now think of a younger female, maybe 35 years or younger. How are they different in what they resonate with? So for example, if I am from Argentina, older males, soccer. You're born, you're given a soccer, football. And you remember Maradona's hand of God, you know, cheating the referee and scoring when shouldn't have counted. And if you're even older, you're thinking of tango and the man dominates and controls and the woman obeys and is, you know, an object of desire and all the lyrics blame the woman for everything that goes wrong in a man's life. Not surprisingly, women are not so keen on those two things from Argentina, if they're young especially. They may be thinking of vegetarian diet and salads which is like, what? Unacceptable by, by some of my peers. They may be thinking Harry Potter. What art and heritage comes to mind, in your opinion, in the older males and the younger females of your country? And what difference does it make in terms of perceptions of climate change? Who is more likely to say in your country that climate change is not a problem at all? in their country in the next 20 years. Because we have those numbers. And not only we have those numbers, but we can share with you a video that gives you a taste. It's only two minutes. So friends from the IT team, over to you. Please share. Thank you. So what do we know about risk in our world? The Lloyd's Register Foundation World Risk Poll is the first global study of worry and risk across the world on subjects such as mental health, cybersecurity, and workplace safety. Now, let's animate some data on a key issue, perceptions of climate change. Globally, the World Risk Poll finds that nearly one in eight people say climate change is not a threat at all. 
in their country in the next 20 years. Let's explore how patterns emerge in different countries. From now on, each pebble will depict one person who answered the question. The poll finds that gender and age make a big difference in some countries. In Singapore, older males are 10 times more likely than younger females to think climate, not a problem. In Rwanda, older males are seven times less likely than younger females to think not a problem at all. Different risk perceptions shape how we understand and address climate risks. Learn more at wrp.lrfoundation.org.uk. So, my friends, as a data geek that I am, when I got access to the data from the last World Risk Poll, I found a treasure trove. I could find things that explained why my scientific work was not transforming into action, because different people react differently to how we convey risk. The 2021 World Risk Poll is now live in the field. 125 countries, despite the pandemic, there's people asking questions and people answering questions. Uh, our colleagues have updated the data that is being collected. What questions are being asked? Can you survive if you lose your income? What has been your personal experience of disasters? Have you been uh, disrupted in critical services like water or transport? If you want, dear listeners, dear participants, dear COP friends, you can play a role in the data analysis of what emerges. I can tell you how fun it was to create that Pebble animation because it made me notice things that hadn't been noticed before, such as the fact that apparently there is a correlation between wealth in a country and whether young females or older males are paying attention to climate change and think it's a problem, not at all. The data that is harvested by this word poll has the power to help us design and deploy impactful interventions. So I'm delighted to invite my dear, dear colleague, Sarah Cambers from the Lloyd's Register Foundation, uh, who leads their evidence and insight team, who is present at the COP in the Blue Room to share with us uh, some insights and some invitations about this. Sarah, if you're there, over to you. I am here, Pablo, thank you. Um, and it's great um, to be here at the COP and to just listen to your session, Pablo. What a great way of bringing to life the value of data and supporting decision making. Um, as Pablo said, we're out in the field at the moment, just to give you a flavour of the variety of variety of countries that we're in at the moment. Gallup tell me as of this morning, they're asking questions in Sri Lanka, in Mozambique, in Iraq, in China and in Belgium. And can you start to think about the difference um, that, that, that the data will show us in terms of people's perception of the risk of climate change? And the reason I'm here today is that I think you're going to be more interested in the, in the results of the 2021 poll because we're not just asking about climate change, but we're asking about many different aspects of resilience as well. So Pablo has given you a flavour on his slide of the, of the questions we're asking. Um, we're asking people how prepared they feel for disaster. Um, we've got four reports on resilience coming. We're asking about um, people's um, agency in relation to disaster, whether they've got a plan to deal with a disaster when it happens, and crucially, who they trust for information, because that's not necessarily the same um, when um, they're facing disaster as, as, as the, um, the sources of information that they're actually using. All of this data is freely available. Uh, it's downloadable from our website and from the UK Data Service, and the 2021 data will be landing in the spring next year. Um, Lloyd's Register Foundation uh, funds a whole range of projects and programs. This is just one of them, um, but it really exemplifies how we need to work in partnership with others. 
because we're a very small foundation and the issues that we're dealing with um, are much, much larger. And so we need to work with others who are interested in, for example, here using the data to influence action and work with communities to really make a difference. Um, so I'm standing here today wanting to attract partners who are interested in using the data. So if you're in the room and you've been inspired by this, please come and talk to me about the poll afterwards. And if you're online, the email's on the slide here. Please do get in touch with me and let us know um, how you'd like to work with us. Um, there are opportunities to influence the analysis as Gallup are pulling their report together to work with us as we launch that data, uh, to build partnerships with others who have an interest in that data. Um, and you can also obviously use the data yourselves. Um, so thank you very much and handing back to Pablo. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you very much to the broader team at the Lloyd's Register Foundation for not only creating data, and by the way, the mere fact of asking those questions to people in 125 countries already in itself constitutes a good effort for climate change awareness. And I'm sure that it will make a difference on adaptation. Because if you're answering questions about disasters, about preparedness, about heat waves, chances are next time the media says something, you will know. The data is a feast for the curious mind and a valuable toolbox for the policy wonks among you. Now I have some work for you. You saw the video, you heard Sarah, but in my experience, when people hear numbers, the numbers don't stay. There are exceptions, but generally speaking, engaging people with numbers can be hard. So what we're going to do now, I hope you're braced on, is to play a game with numbers from the Lloyd's Register Foundation World Risk Poll. Let me tell you what this is about. I'm about to share a screen. Very soon, we will invite you to go to the same website we sent you before, if it works, if you are um, capable of going there. Otherwise, consider this a spectator sport and we'll be telling you. We're going to play a new game we just created with our colleagues from uh, Good Focus Games. The game is called Numbers on the Edge. It will begin shortly. You will be first asked to uh, enter your display name, can be your name or a fake name like Pablo Bot. And then you will be asked a series of very simple questions. For example, what percent of younger female respondents in Argentina do you think that said that climate change is not a threat at all? Now there's a hint, older males was 6.0%. And I can give you an extra help thing, hint. In Argentina, which is kind of a middle-class country, there wasn't too much of a difference between what males of a certain age above 40 answered and what females 35 or less answered. Now, here's the trick. You will write a number between 0, 0.0 or 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 or 3.7 or 10.8 or 45.9 or 100%. And then you will click Submit. There will be a countdown. And here's the story. If your number is bigger than the real number, as elicited from this data analysis, you fell off the cliff. If your answer is too big, poof, you fell zero points. Otherwise, if it's equal or smaller, you get one point. Now, if you're the one who is getting one point and is closest to the real answer, you get 10 additional points. So you want to get as close to the real answer as possible, but not fall off the cliff and get zero. Please, uh, Mark, if you can, type the, uh, the website in the chat. And please let me know via audio if it has been done. The link is there and available. Excellent. So friends, go in, click your name, and uh, start typing answers. And you know what? I'm going to stop sharing. And maybe Mark, um, you can be like the narrator. <laughs> so we're going to invite now people following your uh, pace, Mark. And sorry, I'm, I'm throwing this at you, but I cannot see what people see. So it's probably safer in your hands uh, no with problem. my help. <laughs> no problem. So, if everyone wants to put their name, they can also leave it as anonymous there too. I will go to the next, the first question momentarily. <laughs> and let's uh, have the first question is the one you saw. Argentina, what percent of younger female, 
think climate change is not a problem. The hint is that older males, 6.0%. And you can write with a decimal point. Uh, Mark, feel free to start the countdown somewhat soon, bearing in mind the 15 second delay. We're going to ask for, uh, four of these questions. The winner of the game is the one that gets the most points. Countdown has been started. And for those of you watching online, remember that uh, you have a 15 second delay, so the countdown may happen before. Look at it. Those of you in person, if you don't have a device, talk to your neighbor. What do you think is the precise answer? Is there a difference between older male and younger female in Argentina? If you think it doesn't matter, I'll tell you why it matters later. Okay, we're at the data point. All right. And Mark, maybe if you want to, I know this is uh, throwing something on you, but for those who are in the room and they cannot see, would you be willing and able to share screen so that people can see what viewers are seeing? Excellent, perfect. So there you go. There's an answer in a big blob of green and many other answers. Move on and show what is the correct answer in context. Whoops. One and moment. I can, <clears throat> and feel free if needed to share the admin screen. Eh? It's a, uh, there we go. So most people answered, there you go. That's the, well, look at that. The correct answer was 6.7. And you can see that a majority of people gave a number that was smaller than the correct. So they got one point. A few got either a little bit too much or way too much. So let's advance, show the current scoreboard. And there you go. Juliet, congratulations. You got 11 points. Susanna, AB, and a few anonymous got one point, and a few got zero point in the room where it happens. Let's move on to the next question. Same story, but different country. This time, Australia. How many younger females do you think say that climate change is not a problem at all? The hint is that the older males said not a problem, and it was 21.4% of the males. What, what do you think? Are younger females in Australia more likely or less likely? What percent? Write a number between zero and 100%. I won't give you any clues. If older males, 21.4% likely to say not a problem, what do you think is the answer for females? Let's give you a moment and start the countdown. There you go. Thank you. And uh, the countdown is expiring. And Mark, I would advise that you advance directly to the one that shows the correct answer in context. Uh, next one. And there we go. Look at that. Most of you gave an answer that was way too big because the correct answer is only 2%. 21% of males and 2% of women in Australia, older, younger, think climate change is not a problem. That, of course, has consequences for how you design everything from your you know, decarbonization efforts to your efforts for um, disaster preparedness. Let's move on to the next question. Oh, I see. There are a few players that got 12 points. Congratulations. And now the next question. El Salvador. What do you think in El Salvador? How many younger females say it's not a threat at all, knowing that the males, 7.1%. Now, you may have a soup of numbers in your head, but that's what data is about. Can you make sense of this soup of numbers? If 7.1% of males in El Salvador say climate change is not a problem, how many of the younger female do you think think it's not a problem? Let's start the countdown. Thank you, Mark. And I hope some people answered. Let's see what the pattern of responses is, just like before with the line. There you go. Ha! You're beginning to notice the pattern. 
it looks like in poor countries, more of the uh, younger female, uh, more of them. The correct answer was 13.2. So there, there's a reversal in the answers from poor countries versus from rich countries. Of course, you may be very tired by now. <laughs> it happens. But this game was designed to make you appreciate the patterns that emerge. Uh, Mark, if you want, you can stop sharing. And so uh, people can come to my very profusely hairy face. I am going to skip the last question uh, from the game. I'm going to ask it. For Sweden, the number of males that uh, think it's not a problem, it's very large. I think it was 19%, something like that. What do you think is the percent of younger female respondents in Sweden that said that climate change in their country in the coming 20 years, not a problem at all? How many younger females think in Sweden climate not as a problem? Think of that number, the precise number. How much percent? According to the survey of the more than 100 respondents who are younger than 35 and female in Sweden, you know how many said climate change not a problem? Zero. <laughs> Zero. That's what we want. <laughs> Something has happened with young female in Sweden that made every young female think that climate change is a problem for their country for the coming 20 years. <laughs> Can we harness the power of art, culture, science, technology, innovation, policy, government, foundations, philanthropy, you, to accelerate what happens. <sighs> that was the world premiere of the game Numbers on the Edge. And if you ever have an activity like the word Rispol that needs to invite people to reflect about answers, including surprising answers, feel free to reach out to us. And uh, all the games that we create with uh, the team at Good Focus Games are available for free for humanitarian nonprofits like us, the Red Cross, Red Cross and Climate Center. Thank you, Mark and Daniel and David and team for making so much work happen. Uh, we're going to move on. I'm going to share screen. You already played that game. You already got your answers. And now I'm going to invite you to enter a new territory. You may remember this graph from the very early journal article that I showed that we did with many colleagues uh, involving how do we link early warnings with early action. Indeed, what we say in the journal is that forecasts have to be action-based. A forecast should be actionable. When you communicate it, can we get people to say, oh, if scientists say that, then I should do this or not. So what we're going to do now is to invite each of you to become a decision maker who has to confront tough decisions based on actual scientific forecasts, but in the safety of your session. By the way, some of us have done the math, given the cost of loss and the probability and the cost of action or inaction and how much money you have and so on, when should you take action? All of this that you see on screen is embedded in the game that we are about to play. For those of you who are joining online and have your laptop or desktop, we're going to be playing Decisions for the Season. It's a digital game that uh, involves uh, your decisions based on a forecast. But before we go to the platform, which by the way, it's designed, it's optimized for desktop and laptop, if you're using a tablet or a mobile phone, most likely you'll experience glitches. But we're going to start face to face. So let me stop sharing. Okay, I hope you can see me. Many of you have heard version of this before if you join my sessions. This object, my friends, it may look like a die, but it's not a die. It is the probability distribution function of extreme events based on the historical record of precipitation. Most years, there's no problem, not too much rain, not too little rain. It's good. Your crops, your economic performance is good. It's good. If you do a thumbs up, 
you get one point. People in the room in Glasgow, if you can, please show me your thumbs up, show each other your thumbs up. If you do this and there's no extreme events, you get one point. I'm not in the room, so I cannot see you, but I hope you're engaging. Doing this gives you one point. The more points you get, the more chances of winning. The winner is the player with the most thumbs up. Now, sometimes there could be an extreme event. A six is too much rain. Too much rain can wipe out your thumbs up investments unless you're protected. How do you protect? You protect with an umbrella. People in the room, can you show me your umbrella either by doing this or by doing this gesture? Show it to your neighbor, look around, because we are going to play a game with two rounds. Each of you in the room or at home with your computer has two investment decisions. If you th and I'm going to roll this object twice, the probability distribution function of extreme events based on the historical record of precipitation will be rolled twice. If you think that we will never get too much rain, you don't need umbrellas, you can go for two thumbs up. If you're proven right, you get two points. You're guaranteed to be among the winners if no extreme events. If you think you may get so unlucky that you get two sixes in a row, really bad luck, then you may need two umbrellas. You're guaranteed to not get a crisis, but you also won't get any points. No prosperity, no development. If you think that out of two rolls, maybe one six and one something else, then you could do one thumbs up and one umbrella. Now, if you do this and an extreme event happens, not only you lose everything, you also get a broken heart to represent the crisis. So my friends, in the room and uh, in the chat, for those of you who are joining online, you have two investment units. Will you go for two thumbs up? If so, do this gesture or type in the chat two thumbs up. Will you go for two umbrellas? In which case, do this gesture or show two umbrellas. Or will you go for one and one? In which case, do this gesture or type in the chat one and one. You have 15 seconds to make your decisions. Feel free to talk to your neighbor, but your decision is individual. What are you going to do? How many umbrellas? How many buckets? I cannot see what you're doing. I cannot read the chat. So I'm guessing you're embracing this challenge. The most points is the winner. You have 10 seconds. Show to your neighbors or write in the chat. Two thumbs up, two umbrellas, or one thumb up, one umbrella. About to roll. Five, four, three, two, one, and stop. So now comes the time when we see what nature throws at us. It's a normal die. I don't have a remote control that determines. I'd like to work on such technology, but I don't have it. We're going to roll it here. So I'm going to bring it down. First roll. Uh-oh, a six. So those of you who have two thumbs up, you got a crisis. Let's see what happens with the next roll. No problem. So those of you who did two umbrellas, you wasted one opportunity to make a point. Those who did one and one, you did the optimal decision. You got one point. Those of you who did this, there was an extreme event. You got your investment wiped out. You got a crisis and zero points. Now in the second round, we're going to add some complexity. First, in this object, the probability distribution function of extreme events based on the historical record of precipitation. This represents too much rain. You need an umbrella before it happens, if it happens. And this, my friends, represents too little rain. You need a bucket to collect water if this happens. The second difference is that we're going to roll this object 10 times. And you know, if we roll one six, then you need one umbrella. If we roll five sixes, you will need five umbrellas. You will indicate how many umbrellas by showing in the room with your, you know, this is one umbrella, this is three or four umbrellas, and so on. 
people joining online, you will very soon join a digital platform that will show you that. Indeed, well, let me show you. If you if you want one bucket, you do this. This is four umbrellas, one bucket. This is four buckets, one umbrella. This is two and two, and so on. For those in the room, you may get confused. You'll see your brain gets confused. So share screen. Uh, and for those of you joining from the distance, when Daniel shares the, the website, you will see this screen. That screen shows that the default is you have 10 thumbs up, but you can increase the number of umbrellas if you think there may be too much rain. You can increase the number of buckets if you think there may be too little rain, rolling a one or a six. So Mark is going to share with you the link in the chat. It's the same as before. And we're going to give you less than a minute to make decisions. How many umbrellas, how many buckets? People in the room, look at your neighbor, show you. Are you going to do two umbrellas, two buckets, four umbrellas, four buckets, or something else? Start making your decisions, start increasing. And Mark, I'm going to leave it up to you to notice how things are evolving and to, to make it happen. People are starting to make their decisions. I do want to encourage people to put an identifying name or something that identifies you in the top so you know where your answers lie. So where you see name anonymous in the top right, you can change to your real name or to a fictional name. Because later you'll be able to compare yourself to that. Person. You will see how you perform relative to others. And Mark, let's give everyone a very few seconds, but remember there is a delay. So those of you joining online will be surprised. You will see the mm -hmm. countdown on this on the screen for 10 seconds starting very soon. Yep. The countdown has begun. Make your decisions. We have lots of people with decisions here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop sharing. And Mark, can you either share a screen or tell us what patterns you see emerge? Of course. There are people, some people who are very little risk takers. <laughs> three umbrellas, four buckets, three umbrellas, four buckets, three umbrellas, three buckets, four buckets, two umbrellas. And some people with one umbrella, two buckets. Uh, it's a broad spectrum. All right. So, and those players can see that. Now we come back to me and I'm going to roll this object 10 times and Mark will be entering the values in real time. Those of you in the room, you have to remember how many umbrellas, how many buckets. If you happen to get hit by more uh, sixes than umbrellas or more ones than buckets, you're out, you get a broken heart. First roll, a four, no problem. Mark, let me know if the data is entered. It's in there. Great. Moving on to the second out of 10. A three. No problem. The next one. A two. No problem. Those of you who bought a lot of umbrellas and buckets are thinking, what have I done with my investments? I should have gone for more thumbs up, maybe. That's what happens in the real world where people invest in preparedness and no disaster happens. Oops, sorry. That doesn't count because I let it, it fell off my hand. There we go. Oh. Justice Cosmic, our first drought in the fourth event. Those of you with at least one bucket are safe, but you may be running out of buckets. Moving on, another drought. Those of you who had only one bucket may notice in the game platform that you run out of buckets, you get a broken heart and all your thumbs up become thumbs down. You're in a crisis. I think that was about halfway oh. through. <laughs> we move on. A six, oh. our first extreme event. <laughs> we need an umbrella. Uh, Mark, can we, you tell me how many seasons have elapsed already? That was season six. So we move on to season seven. Most of you still have oh. enough buckets or umbrellas, but some of you are on the edge of survival. A three, no problem. Moving on to the next one. A five, no problem. We have this one 
And let's see how you perform. A five. No problem. Was that the last one, Mark? One more event. One more event coming soon. Oh, another six. So, my friends, the net result is that out of 10 events, you got two extreme too much events and two extreme too little events. So those of you who have at least two umbrellas and at least two buckets are alive and your thumbs up became points. And those who did exactly that, two and two, you got six thumbs up, which means you get six points. Congratulations. That was our first round using the climate based on the probability distribution function of extreme events based on the historical record of precipitation. But have you heard of climate change? My friends, this is the past. The past no longer represents the present. Let me introduce you climate change. Like before, a one in this fictional representation is too little rain. If this happens, you need a bucket. Like before, a three or a two or a four or a five, it's okay, thumbs up are good. But this one is an eight-sided die. A six is too much rain, you need an umbrella. The same is true of seven, and the same is true of number eight. So what are you going to do knowing that the new probability distribution function, according to scientists, says that you can get one out of eight values that is a drought, or six, seven, and eight, three out of eight values that require umbrellas. How many umbrellas, how many buckets? People in the room, you can do the gestures, how many buckets, how many umbrellas with your fingers, or you can talk to your neighbor. People joining online in the same web page, you should be able to see the new invitation, how many umbrellas, how many buckets. Let's give you a minute or less, because you know what? Nature doesn't care that you're learning about climate change. This object is coming. Climate change is coming to you. How many umbrellas, how many buckets? You have 30 seconds. And Mark, we're in your hands to keep us updated on what you see. Okay. And I'm going to ask you uh, at the end if you can share a screen to show the profile of decisions, if it's yes. doable. Um, people are very scared now. <laughs> they do not want to run into a bend. Lots of lots of buckets and umbrellas. Remember, a one is a drought. You need a bucket. An eight is a too much rain. You need an umbrella. Eight sided die. How many of what? You have ten investment decisions. The winner is the one with the most thumbs up. Uh, feel free to start the countdown when you think it's time, uh, Mark. Indeed, it's time. So. Yep, I did, and the countdown just ran out. All right. Would you like to share a screen and we see what happened? Absolutely. Just one moment. Thank you. And my friends, may I note that only 80 minutes have elapsed since I said hello. You have already confronted the decision of making how much of flood protection, drought protection. In the real world, it's much messier. All right, we have a few anonymous. We have two buckets. Whoa, GFG went for four umbrellas, one bucket. Samantha went for three and three. Look at that. If you keep scrolling down, you, oh, look at that. EL went for five umbrellas and two buckets. Dorothy went for four umbrellas and three buckets. So uh, let's stop sharing screen and let me tell you one thing. In the real world, like in the game, it is smart when you get information that the past was one way, but the present and future are different to adjust your decisions accordingly. Like Mark said, many of you went for more umbrellas for change decisions because you got an early warning that says it's no longer like this, it's more like that. And you could get an eight and a seven and a six, maybe you need more umbrellas. You invested in more protection. Now look at you. And look at the world around you. 
are we doing this? Are we adjusting our decisions based on what we are learning from science, whether it's sea level rise, more risk of droughts and heat waves and extreme events or tomorrow cyclone or flash floods in your city. There's going to be much more of this. It's not necessarily more flood. It could be more drought. It could be more drought and more flood. It's certainly more extreme hot temperatures everywhere. It's going to be more bizarre. It's going to be more complex. I hope that throughout this uh, few moments of gameplay, while having fun, you got to experience the complexity of your decisions. Because remember, if you spend all your money in buckets and umbrellas and all you do is protection, you don't get prosperity, you don't get development. Your people are going to complain that you're not giving them what they want to be happy, whether they like what you like or not. This is the trade of being confronted by COP decision makers. How do we increase the ability to make smart decisions fast? If we keep waiting for perfect science and for perfect money, we're going to be toast. We have to do what we can with what we have. And in my experience as a scientist turned humanitarian worker, the best way to accelerate the embrace of science and decisions that make sense is to complement analytically rigorous things from science, from policy, with emotionally enriching and engaging things. I'll be very blunt with you. I am absolutely, completely fed up by the extent to which we collectively waste time. Let me say it again, waste time in events that bring people together and we listen to what we heard before and nothing new happens. You may remember the extent to which in just a week of working with artists, we got so many fascinating contributions from people who are creatives, who heard what happened at the Resilience Hub a week ago and who made awesome happen. Let me refresh your memory by sharing that slide. And uh, I want you to remember, this is fragments of the video you saw. We saw Indonesian artists making batiks. We saw my neighbor Hendrik and the spoken word artist and literary performer Reggie, filmed by Daniel, talk about old instruments and the balance of notes and performances, including crop performance. We saw the mask, we saw video games, we saw puppets melting. We heard from Togo linking the moon to Argentina to Vanuatu. We saw the guardian from the moon inspire artists in Vanuatu make an ephemeral beach art intervention with stones that were washed away by the tide. And they did that because they know that the waters are coming for what they treasure, their culture, their livelihoods. Their kids holding a sign telling us enough. Can we do more? Can we do what needs to be done so that enough people are able to coexist with a changing climate? It is time to pursue resilience. It is time to complement the talking with the doing. And in this session, experiencing the complexity of future risks through serious fun. I hope you had a good time. I have to tell you, in this house, a, a reminder of those thermochromic artworks, we had phenomenally intelligent, beautiful people. Fego, Andrea, Kendra, Daniel, Reggie, and many more around the world. We had the hot poets from London, present in Glasgow, thinking of creating words. They have a chief scientist, for God's sake. A group of poets has a chief scientist to better influence how we speak, what we say, so that the word changes. We, those of us who have the privilege to learn, to connect what we learn with what we do, to link early warning with early action, must continue to what is done at the COP. We must continue to present, to network, to negotiate, 
I fear that if we don't engage artists, designers, creators, we're going to continue to talk about the need to act now, while what people hear is go to sleep, go to sleep, go to sleep. We need to be awake. Professional humorists, humorists help us be awake and connected and notice what is unacceptable yet accepted. That's the world we're living in. We're living in a world where too much is unacceptable yet accepted. And it's, it's, it's the time. It's the time to change how we do, to inspire, to do more, to be more. So I'm going to show two screens. One is a screen that says feedback. Uh, if you go back to the same website, you'll be able to see a, an invitation for you to write over the coming 120 seconds or so. Can you let us know what you thought about this session? Was there anything you enjoyed? Was there anything improvable? What was different? How can we help you? Do you have any ideas for us to link you to the game designers that do so much? There are also one thing I want to share with you in the minute or so I have left. We are collaborating with a team of designers. Matt Leacock, the creator of the game Pandemic, which is at home. My wife and I have played it dozens of times. We call it research. It's a mathematical representation of pandemic risk and potential actions embedded in a game. And it's awesome. Games give people agency to work together at solving problems. Problems that are shared and complex. They're creating Daybreak, a cooperative game about tackling the climate crisis. The prototype exists and is great fun, full of the many moving parts that we need to learn to do things right. We at the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center are helping Matt Leacock and Matteo Menapache, the creator of the game you saw using all the creations from this past week, the memory game. They are creating Daybreak. We, the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center, are helping them. They came up with ideas to implement our call for resilience, for early action, for financing. The New York Times reported on this collaboration. What are the chances of the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center being spoken of at the New York Times about the need for future resilience because of a game? Well, guess what? If you engage people creatively, as we saw from Vanuatu, from Indonesia, from puppeteers in Argentina, more can happen and we can coexist with this freaking out reality that the Atlas of Doom of IPCC is telling us. We're in serious trouble. We need to have serious fun. To learn more, especially uh, to support this Daybreak endeavor, you can go to daybreakgame.org. Help the team, help Matt and Matteo come up with better ways to deliver, deploy, especially they look for feedback from developing countries. Uh, you already saw the feedback. Maybe time is up. Good luck. This is what we came to do. Experiencing the complexity of future risks through serious fun. Serious fun. Thank you, Red Cross, Red Crescent Climate Center. Thank you, Resilience Hub. Thank you, Lloyd's Register Foundation. I had a blast. I had my most awesome professional week this past week, inviting and supporting artists and designers and creators and giving visibility to their awesome work. Thank you, Nico, for the video. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Anastasia and team at the Resilience Hub. Thank you all. Time is up. Good luck. <laughs>